Hello, and welcome to Tortal Sisters, a book club podcast about the works by Tamara Pierce. I'm Risa. And I am Ariana. And that's the intro. That's all you're getting from us. That's what you're getting. You can go over and support Tammy herself on patreon.com slash Tamara Pierce. That's true. And that helps her out. It do. And she's the important one here. It's true. So, what book did we read this month? Um, well, those last few months, uh, we <laughs> read um, the first of the Circle Opens Quartet, uh, Magic Steps. Magic Steps. First off, did we like it? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I'm gonna say, though, that it's a real step down from Briar's book. It honestly it does like it does largely suffer from me wanting to get to Daja's book. So you're like get me cold I'm fire. Like, Actually, I need cold fire now. Street magic is fantastic. I I'm do love very street magic excited for that one. But honestly of this quartet cold fire is cold the fire shit. is the shit. It is it's, so good. It's perfect. Um this book, however, we're talking about magic steps. <laughs> um, and Poor Sandry just I, does not get it the right love. <laughs> this book is, in my opinion, three and a half stars. Yeah. It's not a bad book. No, not at all. And honestly, uh, Sandry does some pretty badass stuff in this book. Sandry is super relatable. And, super relatable. Um, I enjoy this book. It's a, it's a, I enjoyed the book more on this read than on pretty much any other read I've done of the book. Um, so there's that. Yeah. Let's just dive into it, because I feel like it's something in. we need to talk about before, like... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let's do it. Okay, so, chapter one. Sandraline Fatorin is living with Duke Vedris IV, the ruler of the country Emelin, and also... Or, or as we might call him, Duke Vedi the Foe. Or Uncle, uh, Uncle the Duke. <laughs> Uncle the Duke. Uh, Uncle the Duke. So, also her great uncle. After his recent heart attack, though she would like to go back home to Discipline Cottage and Winding Circle, where she spent the last four years with her adoptive siblings, she's wary of leaving her uncle, knowing that going back to his old ways of work might cause another heart attack, one he might not survive. She's so worried about him. She sets her worries aside and joins him for his first ride through the city since his heart attack. <sighs> Pasco Akalon wakes up early to get to go help out his friend Osa. Osa's family are all fishermen. Osa doesn't isn't relevant, but it was better than just saying he he he. Yeah. Um but Osa's family are all fishermen and the fish have all dried up. In the past, Pasco has danced for good luck, so Osa's father is offering Pasco a silver crescent to dance to bring in some fish. Uh Sandry is riding with the duke and notice that it, it, the first chapter cuts back and forth a it lot. really does it th there are a couple earlier chapters that are like whiplash they're like pov whiplash <laughs> they, they are um sandry is riding with the duke and notices how relieved the people are to see him she is also shown that he takes strength from them as well their ride is halted by a mer merchant uh jamar rokat mer merchant <laughs> a mer merchant who very dramatically, um, not the word I want, but that's the only word I could think of, uh, says how glad he is that the Duke is well enough to be with his people. Vedris has an obvious distaste for the man, and they ride on as soon as they can. It's like, oh, felicitations, my good Duke. Having you here lets me know that all is well. And Calm your shit. I don't care about you. And you're still here to protect your people. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Osa's grandma teaches Pasco the dance for bringing in fish. It uses a large fishing net that, goddamn, this first chapter is so choppy and hard to talk about, I am dying here. But the net is real, but also symbolic at the same time, okay? Pasco does the fucking jig and is like, hell yeah. But then there is clapping nearby and he looks at it and sees that it is <gasps> the Duke. Dramatic dun, music dun, sting. Dun. Thank Sorry. you. I thought yeah. I'd insert it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Um... I was going to note um, that Osa never comes back, but um, his grandmother, uh, Grandmother Netmender, does a couple of times. Anyway, uh, <laughs> chapter two. Um, I kind of laughed maniacally while writing this, so let's see how it turned out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I kind of felt like that writing a lot of these, especially chapter seven. So get ready for chapter seven in a hey, bit. Hey, hey. <laughs> okay. Um, so chapter two. 
Posco is like, oh shit, not only is the Duke here, but he's got this like really pretty older girl with him. You and Sandria's Posco? like, yes. I said it Pasco. Okay. Like Pascal. Well, I'm probably going to keep calling him Posco. Okay. Like Costco. Pasco. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, he's like, oh, there's this really pretty older girl with him. And Sandry is like, I want to bro, bro out over magic. But Posco is like, <laughs> nah, I can't do magic. And she's like, bitch, I know magic when I see that. And that's magic. Doesn't help that Osa's like, oh, yeah, he does magic dances. We're, we're going to get so much fish. And then he like tells them about, oh, yeah, he does dances for wishes. And he does dances for luck. And it's like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Uh, by now, Uncle Duke Vedris has come over and he's like, wait, you're an Akalon? Because not only he has not only heard of this uh, boy's hairier ancestors, but also knows his recent, fam- recent family, like his parents and his grandfather. Uh, basically, he's got cop blood on all sides of his family, and it's like, who started breeding these people for this? They are hounds, bred for one particular thing, and it's kind of upsetting. No, no, no. Calling them dogs and stuff, that is in a future trilogy, Ariana. Right, They're called right. Harriers in this one. My bad. I skipped to Becca Cooper. Um, <laughs> uh, not put off by this, Sandry starts telling Posco about Pasco about you how can he call him needs- Posco. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, how he needs to hone his magic because otherwise he could really fuck shit up. And Uncle Duke Vedris is is like, hey, Sandra, introduce yourself. And Posco gets to realize that he's in the presence of, like, one of the greatest ma- mages to have ever lived thus far. Uh, since he's even more overwhelmed by the prospect than he even was before, he refuses to believe it and tries to st- and starts trying to get away. Um, he, this boy literally backs out of rooms on several occasions, and I love him so much. Oh, um, poor little ADHD baby. Little, oh, I'm so relatable, man. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a serious situation. I'm gonna see you guys later. Late. Uh, just then, a messenger comes to tell the Duke that Jamar Rokot is dead. And, and the Duke's like, does my thought, do my thoughts kill people? Because you know he was thinking, God, I wish this guy would just drop dead. Anyway, um, like, not in an accidental or natural way either. He, like, real dead and bloodied. The Duke excuses himself, taking advantage of a moment to go be a big boy and not have his nursemaid of a niece by his side. Pasco, that beautiful ADHD child, exposits that the Rokots are an important merchant family, and it's weird that the murderers got to him, and, and that... And then why the cops are called Harriers, because they uh, have coloring of Harrier Hawks. And then why their stations are called Coops, because birds. And they catch rats. See, it all, it all makes some kind of sense. Sandry asks if Pasco wants to be a Harrier, and he's like, <laughs> don't got a choice. So she's like, okay, I'll bet you that the fishermen bring a, a, in a ton of fish when they come in. Then you'll have to get magic training. He's hesitant, but figures, whatever, it's not even like a lady would know when the fishing ships come back to port. So what are the odds that she'll even know? So the 14-year-old goes off to a murder scene, and the 12-year-old runs back home to help his mother before he and his cousins have cop lessons. This book is real weird when you describe it. (laughs) It is, though! Sandra beelines it to Rocat House. To, I, we, we just did not agree on any pronunciations in this, and I'm not going to try and change it. We're not standardizing <laughs> any of this. I need to find this page, though, so give me one second. Sandry beelines it to Rocat House to catch up with her uncle. The provost guards watching the entrance don't want to let her, uh, don't want to let her in, or her bodyguards, Oama and Quabin, the real MVPs of this book, to be honest. Uh, they don't want to let her, them in until she uses a magic cord to talk to her uncle. The magic cord is never used again, and I think that's a shame. On Vedris, and only on Vedris. Only on Vedris. Literally just this one time it works. She's just like pulls out her magic cord and is like, uncle, tell them to let me in. And he like pops his head out and is like, oh no, you don't need to come in. And Sandry is like, I really must insist. Um, I'm no stranger to bad things, uncle. I really must insist. Quabin and Oama traded looks. They had heard her say that only once, on the day of the Duke's heart attack, when his servants had tried to keep Sandry out of his room. After she had l- she had lost precious minutes in argument with them, she had finally insisted in just that tone of voice. When they refused, every thread in the hall outside the Duke's rooms, from carpets, tapestries, and even servants' clothes, unraveled and came to light, cocooning them all. Sandry had gone to her uncle and had spent the rest of that day with the healers, keeping him alive with her magic until they could strengthen his heart. <laughs> Quabin and Oama had never forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Uh, and then Vedris is like, oh, fine, and let her admit her. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, 
then when Sandra gets to the murder scene, she sees Jamaro Cat's headless body and all his jewels uh, piled up as if to say, we did this murder for murder's sake, not for his money. <laughs> Which is a badass, badass statement, not gonna lie. <laughs> Sandry sees all of the protection magic in the room because she can see magic due to shenanigans in previous books. She tells the cops that no one broke in because none of the spells got tripped. The cops patronize her, a cab. So Uncle the Duke, <laughs> yes, that's his name because I say so, uh, is like Nancy Drew, Drew voice. I think your phone's about to ring. Uh, and they leave. <laughs> it was like a, I'll let you get back to your work. Uh, <laughs> that's a, uh, you yeah. know. For anyone who listens to our other podcast, Krollmeister Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> um, they get back to the Citadel and Uncle Duke's Seneschal? Seneschal. Thank you. Seneschal. Baron uh, Erdogan? Erdogan. Erdogan. Okay, so you called him Erdo? Okay, that's fine. I did. <laughs> Baron Erdogan is basically like, I was worried sick. Uh, Vedris goes to lie down before lunch, which worries Sandry and Erdo a little bit. Uh, but also they're glad that he's taking care of himself. Pasco does combat training with his family and tries to drop in the idea about dancing magic, but he gets shut down about it. We also learn that his older cousin, Vani, in particular, is a complete asshole. Just a fucking asshole. Just a real little shit. After an afternoon of helping Vedras with, affair, with the affairs of Emelyn, Sandry pops down to the fishing village to go check in with Pasco on how his magic did and finds that the fish haul for the day is gigantic. <laughs> Osa's dad pays Pasco five times the original agreement because it's bad luck to underpay a mage. <laughs> Pasco will not hear about him having magic and runs off, so Sandry decides she has to go to Winding Circle and talk to Mommy. I mean, Lark. <laughs> and... Um, that talk is going to completely encapsulate chapter four. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Sandry is taken to discipline by Owama and Quabin, Quabin, whatever. Um, Quabin, that's fine. Um, she tries to ditch them once they're inside the walls of Winding Circle, but those two are like, oh no, see, something can happen to you and we get beheaded? No. Um, and she finds Lark in the otherwise empty house. Rosethorn and Briar left with Briar's shotgun, so there's no uh, tree in the window. And Nico and Triss took Little Bear with them, so no pupper at the gate to greet her. And Daja went off with Frostpine to have mystery caper, which we will discuss in a few months, so no metal clanging or tang in the air. But Lark is there. Yeah, she is good. I hate the idea of her being alone. I know it's she's fine, um, and but uh, like she should never be alone because she is so good. Um... Lark is excited by this unexpected visit and tells Sandra she's expecting some students to live with her to live there soon. More troublemakers like the four siblings. Uh, Lark jokes that it will probably be easier for the first few months without Lark being all scary and making things difficult, though she says never to tell her that. Uh, she misses Sandry but is glad she is taking care of Uncle Duke Vedras because uh, she's the only one who really can. He he doesn't respond to uh <sighs> He doesn't respect or care about the opinion of most people who try to coddle him, but he's putty in Sandry's hands. It's true. Yeah. Uh, being stitch witches, they gotta talk while working with fabric. So imagine Sandry getting a little frayed when she... Uh, Sandry's magic getting a little frayed when she gets upset or, or, or nervous, okay? You guys have to imagine that, because I couldn't write it all in. It just happens, like, naturally. Anyway. Yeah. Sandry explains uh, Posco to... Lark and hopes that in her dancer tumbler days she may have come she may have had some experience with this kind of thing. She's heard of it, but not had a lot of experience. She informs Sandry to her chagrin and despair that the mage who discovers a new mage has to teach them, at least until another teacher can be obtained. Sandry's like, but Lark, I discovered him. And Lark is like, I didn't think I raised an idiot, but she doesn't actually say that. Because she's Lark, but you know. She's like, yes, I, I am aware, honey. Anyway, uh, Molly Lark gives Sandry some good talking, reminding her she isn't so far away from the beginning of her own journey that she can't remember the basics. She also reminds her that she isn't physically far away from Winding Circle and its citadel of mages who can help. Sandry is like, you were so patient with me. And Lark is like, you thought you needed patience? You were perfect because she was and is. Um, Lark tells Sandry that the Akalons may need to hear from her may need to hear from her directly about Pasco needing uh, training. Um, she figures it'll come a little easier for them. Uh, Pas uh, no. Whoop. And that she will comb her Rolodex for a dance teacher for him. Sandry is going to be okay. 
Chapter 5. <laughs> During baton practice, Pasco's asshole cousin Vani is bullying Pasco. So Pasco does what any 12-year-old who just discovered that he has magic does. <laughs> he does a little dance and makes Vani stay stuck up in the air. Cue the panic uh, as he can't get him and the two innocent bystanders. Sta- bystanders? Bystanders? <laughs> you know, the standard of being a bi something. Yeah, uh, the, the bisexual standard. That's me. <laughs> You guys are being there held to this amazing standard. To the bystanders. Um, so the two innocent bystanders. <laughs> I can't speak. <laughs> innocent bystanders. Uh, he can't get them down. That's the, the, that. I, so yeah. like one nasty cousin and then two perfectly fine uh, cousins, cousins are up there with just, him. Yeah, they were just in the way. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so cute too. Paso's grandpa, Granther Edouard, um, comes mm-hmm. out and is like, what's all this ruckus? Um, because he's an old dude. And when it's explained to him what happened, he gets very cross with the children for letting Vani be a little bully. Uh, <laughs> a cab except for this man. He's he's literally like, I, I you, you guys didn't say anything. I can't, we're going to have to have a talking to if you're going to, we can't bring this kind of bullying to the Harriers. I'm like, like I'm, I, I, would, I would hate to see what he does when he has power. How, yeah. it's like, oh snap. <laughs> yeah, this guy gets it. Uh, and then he tells Pasco to go get someone who can help. Um, as Sandry, the Duke, and Erdo are discussing affairs, Pasco runs in after it hasty bows to the man, to the men. Uh, mm-hmm. He explains the situation in a panic. Sandry is like, oh, so you agree? You do have magic. He's like, yes, please help. So she goes back at the Acalon house. Such a 14-year-old girl. Just yeah. such a 14-year-old oh, girl. Oh, I'm sorry. You you admit that you do have magic? That I'm so right? You, you, yeah, this is this is true. I, I can only continue forward if you admit this. <laughs> back at the Acalon house, Sandry's like, I don't know if I can help. But once he agrees to take lessons with her, she's like, okay, let's meditate first. Uh, so she gets him thinking about what he needs to do to undo the spell. Um, she almost forgets to ward him before doing the meditation. And yeah. she's like, shit, I'm going to be a bad teacher. I'm, gonna get I'm a, a bad mom. I'm going to get a, a bad grade in teacher school. Um, <laughs> back in the courtyard, uh, Sandry helps Pasco figure out that what he needs to do in the is to do the dance backwards. Um, I, I accidentally put backyards in the document, which is why... <laughs> I uh, I stumbled there for a second. Um, he needed to do the dance backwards, meaning he has to jump down to get them down. Sandry ties Vonnie's mouth shut with her power, which isn't relevant, but it's such a Sandry moment. Um, after succeeding in bringing the cousins down, Sandry and Pasco's mom uh, set to talk about lessons, though also... Um, they're like, um, you should probably not leave him like this. And so she's like, oh, right. And unzips Vani's mouth. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it all is also worth noting that, um, all through that, all of the other cousins that aren't Vani are like giving little, they're like, oh, he needs to jump down. Yeah. They're <laughs> being really cute. That's one of the ones that's up in the air. And she's just like, oh yeah. She's just excited to contribute. Yeah. Um, so now we find, just going to com- start name dropping these people, Alzina and Nurhar Dihanur. I it's just going to happen. Dihanur gonna ha- is what I Dihanur? said. So. Mm-hmm. Um, the killers of um, Jamar Rokat. Just putting that out there. Um, they discuss where they will kill his brother, uh, Kassam Rokat, who we will learn about very soon. They sling their mage to their back, as he has no legs and is so skinny from dragon salt, like meth and heroin had a super baby, um, so that they can use to carry him um, and head out to kill the man. Um, We don't quite know what any of this means yet, other than the fact that this mage, who is addicted to meth uh, x cocaine, um, (laughs) he is... Meth cane, if you will. M- meth cane, yes. Um, <laughs> the salt, as they call it. Um, he does unmagic, but I have a thing that I wrote down, apparently on page 85. Oh, mm-hmm. as to why they're, how they're so terrible to him. Um, oh, God, yeah. Uh, once <laughs> Nurhar had settled his cloak, Alzina helped him to strap the carry frame on his back. All ready for a stroll, Grandpa? She asked the mage. I'm ready to die, he whispered. I'll be readier still in an hour. Too bad, Alzina told him. (gasps) 
Oh my god. See, there is a detail of this that I'd completely forgotten oh. until like the very end and when I was just like get said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It's, uh, yeah. But we'll get to that heartbreaking <laughs> bit. Um brief as it may be. <laughs> I know, right? There's like not any time spent on that and None. I wish there was. I know. Um chapter 6. Kasam Rokot, <laughs> brother of dead Jamar Rokot, shows up and Uncle Duke is like, ugh, this bitch is here to whine about his brother being murdered. Get a load of this Erdo and Sandry. I love him, but Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, literally, I'm- they're all like, okay, we didn't even mention that Erdo literally says good riddance when they say that Jamar yeah. Rokat died. Basically, uh, we glossed over this whole fact about the Rokat family. They are... Uh, merchants but they are also a crime family but i will get into uh, some of their uh nastiness um okay kasam enters the court and does the whole this isn't suitable for a lady song and dance but erdo the voice of ariana at this point is like fucking talk or leave and the duke is like bro chill um <laughs> it's like you but were just bitching about this sandry <laughs> like specifically mentions she's like oh they do this a lot they must do this where yeah. one of the, you know, basically good cop, bad cop. She, like, notes that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you say that later? A little bit. Um, I apologize. So, Kazam has shown up in an attempt to hasten the investigation into his brother's murder because he doesn't think her lady provost is getting, uh, giving it the urgency he thinks it is needed. He makes it sound like he knows who might have done it and might be coming after House Rokot. I meant Rokot House, but I think I was watching a lot of Game of Thrones things, so I was like, yeah, you know, House Stark. Um, Kassam feigns innocence, and we get to see my favorite detective show, The Duke and the Baron, as Vedris and Erdo play the roles of strict ruler and bitchy court advisor to get the truth out. Uh, He finally admits that a rival merchant family, the Dihoners, are more likely than not to blame. The Dihoner have a monopoly on frankincense and want the Kassam's uh, monopoly on myrrh. No word on the monopoly of gold, though. Uh, (laughs) Word has reached Emelyn that the Rokots back home in Janal, his parents, grandparents, sisters, and brothers-in-law, have all been killed. Uh, So while they are willing to accept that the Dihoner are trying to wipe the Rokots from the face of the planet, they question why the murderers are going through the hassle of displaying the heads. Uh... Kassam is like, okay, so maybe a Dihoner back in Janal cut in front of my great uncle at church, so my brother cut off that guy's head and displayed it on the city walls. Kaswa. Um, Vedras and Erdo definitely think this may have been deserved, but advise that the Rokots, but uh, advise the Rokots not to bunch up, and Vedras orders some guards to be on Rokot de- detail. Who knows where the Dihoner might be? The Dihoner are lying in wait. Well. <laughs> Alzina, who married into the Dihoner family, and her husband, Nurhar, are lying in wait. They are surprised by the extra guards, but it does not deter them in the slightest. Alzina takes Kassam's head, noting that it will be unseen in her bag, as it is covered in unmagic, like she is. She also notes that her husband will get the mage and meet up with her later. The reader is left with more questions than answers. Just... I like how you you did you glossed over the fact that she killed him and immediately went to she had his head. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so- I mean, basically that is kind of the thing. Alzina is really quick with the sword. Yeah. Um she is not to be fucked with. She's not. Especially I I mean in, in normal occasions she shouldn't be fucked with, but she's invisible right now. So <laughs> don't fuck with her. Yeah, and she runs in and fucking slashes um the fucking horse's tendon so it mm-hmm. falls down on top it's of the a guard. bloody mess a literal bloody mess <laughs> and um they use confusion bombs which are an interesting bit of world building <laughs> that just don't touch on <laughs> we never talk about again <laughs> and we'll never talk about it again um <laughs> that's going to the vault <laughs> chapter seven chapter seven is really fucking weird I'm going to say, guys, and I didn't put everything in it, okay? Just, I couldn't. Okay, so, the provost guard dropped the news of the murder on Uncle the Duke while he's eating dinner. Uh, And Sandry is like, (sighs) Uh, they're told that one of the Duke's guards who went with them broke his leg, so Sandry pays a visit to him in the infirmary. 
Sandry sees that the healer is struggling too much to heal the dude's broken leg, even for someone who has been healed many times in the past. So she examines him and finds a shadowy smudge on his leg. A harrier mage uses his special magic eyeglass and agrees it's there. The harrier mage is introduced as Wolfric Snaptrap, who look, I see, Look with your special eyes. I see him, and I have since I was a child, as, um, what's his name? The guy, the actor who plays, okay, this is going to be a weird reference for this man, but the guy who plays the king in Cinderella, the Brandy version. What's that actor's name? Oh, Mary Toby um, Goldberg in the movie. Him. You know, just I never remember exactly that actor's name. Exactly in that him, role. Yeah. Exactly in that role, how he works. That's you know, Wolfric to me. I and can I don't definitely know why. see that in manner. Um, yes. But for whatever reason, I legitimately picture uh, the inventor that takes over the uh, Eastern Air, or the Northern Air, whatever, the Air yes. Temple in uh, Okay, <laughs> yes, I see that. I see that. Yes. But I'm still gonna think of them. Yeah, no, yeah. I get I get that though. Yeah, yeah, valid. <laughs> um, Sandry has the healer take all his magic out of the injured guard and uses her magic as, as thread and weaves it. The magic, just magic. There's no actual thread here, just so you know. Yeah. I got confused she... and had to read it like three times to figure out if there was actual <laughs> thread going on here. But no, it's just magic, just so you know. I feel like um, that is a part of it. She uh never mind. But, I'll talk about it after. Um she uses the magic as thread and weaves it underneath to get it off of the guard and then creates like an entire magical weaving bag. Um, <laughs> just removes it from him. Wolfric has her put it in a magically protected silk bag so that he can take it and study it. They did the same to a shadow on the guard's partner and Wolfric goes off to study it. Side note, apparently Vedras has a magical pacemaker and I love that little bit of world building. And it is yes. dropped in casually. He has a steady heart charm. He has a magical pacemaker. That's it's so, so good. fucking cool. Um, the next morning, between Captain- that and the uh, the prosthetic leg from uh, the mm-hmm. end of of Dasha's book, it is Dasha's book. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> those yeah. are those are great bits of 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 like medical fantasy. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Fantasy done right, mm-hmm. like kind of like auto mail mm-hmm. feeling. Exactly. Um. Right. The next morning, Pasco arrives for his lessons, obviously uncomfortable being in the Citadel. Sandry mm-hmm. almost forgets to ward them for his lesson, but Pasco remembers, and Sandry lets him think that it was a test for him. Sandry mm-hmm. is super annoyed that Pasco isn't immediately good at meditation like she was, and man, I completely understand why I related <laughs> so hard to Sandry when I was her age. Um, I have a lot more patience now, um, but when it's like something that's so easy to you, and someone else is having so much trouble getting it, and they just aren't really trying, and they're not listening to you about it. God, is that the most frustrating thing in the world? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. It's just like, and I just want to help you. And, but <laughs> like that, no, you're just not. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, she then bribes him to keep doing lessons by saying that the sooner he gets better at meditation, the sooner he can actually do dancing lessons. Uh, <laughs> she also tells him to meet her elsewhere next time so he isn't uncomfortable because him just feeling uncomfortable in the house was a huge reason as to why he couldn't focus. Mm-hmm. Um, Lark comes to see Sandry at the Citadel and brings along a friend, the famous dancer Yasmin Hebet. Yasmin says that she has retired from the traveling dancer life and opened up a dancing school in the city, which is very, very convenient for us. Very. Um, while she doesn't know of any dance mages, she would love to teach Pasco dancing itself while Sandry does the mage stuff. Uncle the Duke comes down and greets the ladies and flirts with Yasmin. And mm. Sandry is like, oh, yes, <laughs> please. Uh, Wolfric shows up with, with news and the Duke is all like, ladies can stay for this. I trust them. Sir, just because you think Yasmin is pretty does not mean you can trust her. But in this case, you are correct. Yeah, you get you got lucky, my good sir. You know what? Honestly, I'll bet you uh, he has probably the best... Um, gut about that sort of thing so i can absolutely see him being like i'm not attracted to that person because i can't trust them true i can see that head cannon yeah um wolfric is like yeah the mage who did this is addicted to dragon salt and also this is unmagic hey is anyone eating these snacks (laughs) (laughs) literally he literally (sighs) in the middle of talking about all of this he looks over and he's like oh it 
are you going to eat this? <laughs> and it's like he just dropped this bombshell about fucking unmagic. There's so so much ADHD representation in this fucking book. <laughs> Honestly, though, I mean, the four babies yeah. in general either are autistic or have ADHD, and you cannot yeah. tell me otherwise. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, okay, remind me at the end, we're going to have that conversation to decide who's who. Okay. And I have big, I have big ideas about it. Um, but Lark is like, oof, okay, gotta go talk to the Mage Cancel about this. And Vedris then is like, oh, let's place the remaining Rokats under protection. <laughs> Send some guards. We don't want them to to just die. Um, you know, the, D- the Dihanars are in place to do their ma- next big murder, even though they can see all the guards disguised as servants and such. Nurher plants fucking battle fire in the Hayloft. By the way, that Bad. like fucking, it's just it's it's napalm. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> he just leaves napalm in the hayloft for a distraction, and also hires some riffraff to start a fight while drunk to distract. Um, Alzina travels over the roofs to get in during the distra- distractions and kills a baby, a child, the Rocat. I don't remember which one it is, uh, and then his wife because who knows if she's pregnant? She's young and pretty. Maybe she's pregnant. Better kill her just in case. Uh, on her way out, she gets hit with an arrow in her ankle, and she drips blood into her boot as she gets away. Yay! Chapter 8. <laughs> Sandry goes to the market to get some supplies and, of course, happens upon another crime scene. She immediately sees smears of unmagic and goes to investigate. She is met with little resistance because the first thing she does is attempt to preserve the evidence. The guard she speaks to is like, okay, yeah, you seem sensible enough to know what you're talking about. Like, this is literally the first person who doesn't go through the my lady rigmarole. Um, anyway, using every bit of silk she is wearing, like, she uses her under things. With, so she takes them off using magic, which is so funny. It's um, hilarious. It's so relatable. So relatable. We've all done it. We've all changed out underneath our clothing. Yeah. Um, Sandry covers and follows the unmagic footprints, which she realized were showing up because the suspect had been injured and bleeding. It seems they figured it out and stopped the bleeding because the footprints fade out. Sandry's approached by Wolfric and co- and commended for her quick thinking. With him are the are two harrier mages, Ulrina and Behazen. Because he behazen all them fools. Um, <laughs> I thought it literally every time. He behazen. Behazen out there. Um, I... <laughs> Don't even know why. Uh, the four discuss how they can use herbs to pull the unmagic from the silk. It's it's a really cute, like, just mage moment. Um, yeah, meeting of the minds. Uh, it's so good. They're, they're like, finishing each other's sentences. It's, I love it's it. like they're geeking out. It's so good. I love it. They're just like, oh, yeah, we all know this. This is a I common mean, thing we know because we are of, of the same, like, yeah. area of expertise. Anyway. Um, <laughs> they're treating her like an adult mage, and I think that's why it's such a good moment. Yeah. Um, Wolfric is glad to see blood because that could help them find the killer. Blood wants to return to the body, so basically they use them as bloodhounds. <laughs> Yay. Um, back at Rokot House, uh, they are quarantining anyone who has traces of the unmagic on them so that they can it can be removed or cleansed away. Um, the place is soaked in blood. The worst of it is in the nursery, where two children were murdered in front of their nurse. Sandry holds it together, but Wolfric sends her home because she has done more than enough. When Sandry gets back to the Duke Citadel, she finds that every Rokot in the city is being rounded up and protected by the protected in the inner keep of the Citadel. Uh, another he- head was set up in the middle of Fountain Square, where anyone could see it. A healer sees Telzina's injuries, and then they kill the healer and her guard. Um, and then they make, uh, they have the mage, um, disappear the bodies with his unmagic, um, after denying him the salt that they're keeping him addicted to. Uh, Nurha realizes that Alzina bled outside her boot and gets upset, but Alzina is apathetic about it. That's that magic for you, folks. Uh, on their way out, they burn the inn down. As you do. For good measure. <laughs> uh, Sandry has a nightmare about drowning in unmagic. She's very prone to nightmares. Just, yeah. uh, she has them since she, she was a child. She internalizes everything so badly that it all manifests as she goes to sleep. It's I like, 1000% understand that. 
When she wakes up, she comforts herself with the magic circle of thread that has her friend's powers in it. You know the one. The one uh, you have to describe every single time and, and, and talk about exactly how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just in case someone has picked up this book without reading the previous ones, it can still be an it's enjoyable true. book it's on true. its own. You know? You don't it's need... just like, well, that's a story. Maybe I'll go back and find those afterwards. Yeah. I yeah. mean, really, it could be. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. Um, but uh, Sandra and Pasco meet at an inn, and she has no patience for him. He seems to be mopey until she tells him to focus or she won't take him to dance class. At the end <laughs> of the hour, she takes him to oh, Yasmin's school, and he's like, oh, do you know who this is? And she's like, yes, that's... So that's why I'm taking you here. <laughs> uh, Yasmin is a terrible dance teacher. And um, oh my fucking God, I'm going to rant about this as someone, you know, who is injured in dancing and dance mm-hmm. class and stuff like that. And who like was a dance teacher and made a conscious effort to never do any of this stuff. To do the opposite of it, in fact. Which yeah. is like forcing your students down into stretching positions. The thing that literally dislocated my hip at the age of nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Age of eight. I... Yeah. Ah. Basically, um, the Yasmin dance scenes really communicate uh, that Tammy either, one, has not ever had any dance training... Um, or two, she had a little bit in the 80s when it was all like, push yourself, push yourself, and like, uh, okay, get your leg as high as you can, and it's like, oh, that's yeah. dislocated, that's dislocated. Yeah. Anyway, basically yes. what we're saying is this is not good dance uh, instruction or form. Guys, no. don't pay attention to Yasmin. No, please don't. It's it's like a chorus line. Yes, exactly. When I was talking about the leg up thing, yep. yeah. I was just seeing, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, huh. After the lesson, uh, Uncle the Duke arrives and is like, oh, I was hoping you were here. Uh, let's go get lunch. Oh, oh Yasmin would be honored if you joined us. And Sandry <laughs> puts her matchmaking shoes on. Uh, Sandry has more nightmares. Um, but then the next day during Pasco's lesson, she starts wondering if the fishnet spell could be altered to bring criminals instead of fish. And then she does a bunch of brainstorming. Uh, then uh, the Uncle Duke arrives okay. again to take the ladies out to lunch. Again. Excellent. Again. <laughs> uh, chapter 10. Sandry and Uncle Duke Vedras are having lunch with Yasmin <laughs> when Wolfric bursts in. Sandry sees this as an opportunity to play matchmaker and leaves her uncle and the dancer alone. Unfortunately, he was showing up with some bad news. Uh, one, the blood was so tainted by a magic that it didn't do any good. Two, the searches of the Duke order turned up three suspicious characters who were followed to a healer's place where they killed the healer and his guard, and then they burned down the inn. You know, everything that we already talked about, but Sandry's learning it for the first time. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of this book, is we see something happen and then we hear about it. So, um, yeah... Wolfric brings Sandry and, of course, uh, Quabbin and Awama to Rolcott House to see what they might find. Just as they're entering the room where Jamar Rolcott died, I don't, yeah, uh, Wolfric falls dead at the hands of a man and woman. Uh, Quabbin and Awama fight the pair as the woman mage, uh, sorry, as the woman calls for a mage to help them get out of there. At the same moment, Sandry sends her magic to bring in some guards to help. As the fight continues, the mage becomes easier to see. Just as he opens a sort of unmagic portal, I guess, he's super creepy and says, come away, come away, dinners, come now. Um, uh, They do so and disappear, but the mage looks to Sandry and explains briefly, they have the salt, before sort of lulling uh, like the uh, other father from Coraline into the portal. Like, that's all I could see. That whole sequence. I was like, uh Um... The unmagic feels Sandry's magic and pull tries to pull her into the portal. Luckily, Owama and Quabin grab Sandry in time and hold her until the portal closes itself, and they are left in the bloody room with Wolfric's body. It's really upsetting. And, and she goes, I liked him. Yeah. She she try she she can't mourn him at that moment. Um, but she does she does say to Quabin, I liked him. And and he's very sympathetic. And yeah. and she says to his body as she goes to clean blood off of his face, you don't have to tell uncle any bad news ever again. <laughs> and it's 
hurts so bad. It's not called for. Um, but there is no time to mourn. So <laughs> since she couldn't save safe, good job, Ariana. Since she couldn't save Wolfric, Sandry does what she can to help. She heals a cut Quabbin got and clears the room of unmagic remnants. She gets the courage to handle some of the unmagic and realizes she's able to spin it like wool. Um, she's just kind of like, because it's drawn to her power, she can like pull it up and like twist it uh, like a little fibers. Anyway, um... God, my brain just went, twist it, bop it. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Behazen and Ulrina show up to take the material for inspection. She turns it over and submits to questioning by a provost investigator. After she is questioned, Captain Case, Captain Case tells her that, who is, I believe, a, a relative of... Um, uncle. Yeah, it's Pasco's uncle. Yeah, whatever. An asshole. Um, Captain Case tells her that maybe, she should... Maybe he's Vani's dad. <laughs> probably. Uh, she shouldn't have interfered in the unmagic collecting. Sandry is too tired to be polite, pulls an Ariana. So hold on, I have to... Because it's delightful. This is I pity your children. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna like pick through it. Uh, Sandry rubbed her hands over her face. At least you had the sense not to interrupt me while I was working, she informed the man, ignoring his indignant gasp. And my uncle will understand why I involved myself. Posco really is related to you? Because he's not at all stiff. She was being rude, as rude as her friend Triss. She would probably spend days writing proper, properly apologetic note after this was all over, but she didn't care. Uh, he, you know, is like, oh, you're under strain, you know, you're not bred to deal with this kind of violence. <clears throat> anyway, Sandry got to her feet. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, she, he also says, sorry, no, I'll just read that part. <laughs> um, dancing, even dancing magic, whatever that means, will not clothe him or feed his children when he is a man. It would be better for you to send him to Lightbridge or, uh, Lightsbridge or Winding Circle for lessons and for him to settle once and for all into training he needs for her real work. <sighs> Sandry got to her feet. This time she trembled with fury as she stared up into the captain's eyes. Until you know more of magic, you will not voice opinions about it. Each word dripped from her lip like a chunk of ice. For your information, I am proud and honored to be Pasco's teacher. He will be a credit to me. If he's a scapegrace with odd imaginings, words he used, just so we're clear, uh, perhaps it's because no one gave him reason to think he had anything good to offer. The captain came to a jarring halt against the a windowsill. She had backed him out of the inner office and across the outer one. He will settle for what, wherever his power takes him. And if the mages of Winding Circle te Temple can't tell where that is, I really don't think you should hazard a guess. Am I done here? <laughs> the captain nodded tight-lipped. Then I have business that will not wait. Good day to you, Captain Case. <laughs> I feel yeah. that so bad. That is so good. Um, it, honestly, it's such a cathartic moment. <laughs> it really, really is. Uh, Sandra tries to apologize to Behazen and Elrina for not being able to save Wolfric. They are too used to this business and know she couldn't possibly be blamed. Sandry and her loyal guards head to Winding Circle instead of the Duke's Citadel because she has to be able to do something moving forward. Vedris has a hissy fit when Lark and Sandry tell him about the plan. Oh. The plan is for Sandry to spin the unmagic like it is wool uh, and use that to make cord of unmagic and tie that into knots into a net like the magic fishing net. Um, and then hopefully that net plus dancing magic will bring the unmagic to the uh, the net, yes, uh, so that they can be captured. Um, Lark has to do has to be like, bitch. Sandry is literally the only person who can spin pure magic, so she's the only one who can do this with unmagic. Um, and she's like, she starts talking. Uh, every other one that I know, every other stitch which I know has to have actual physical like cloth and thread to actually do anything from but sandry and she's like lark no she's like embarrassed <laughs> and lark's like no honey he has to people have to know why your magic is so um what's the word In so potent so yeah it's something like that i don't know i didn't actually none of this is is me reading by the way this is me remembering yeah. <laughs> that scene really well um <laughs> 
<laughs> because I fucking love it. Because it's Mama Lark going, look, yeah, my baby I, is real fucking good at what she does. When Lark goes off, it's always like, you fucking deserved that. <laughs> because it is so few. Um, it's like, whew. Um, Lark also drops the bomb that with unmagic, they'll be able to penetrate the inner keep. And Erdo is like, <laughs> no, they can't. But then guards arrive. Because Erdo has great timing. He does. Fantastic. Alzina has severe depression caused by the unmagic. It's like, wow, been there, girl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, I don't have any reason to exist outside of this uh, goal. I just want to finish this I, and die. When I reach the goal, no one will have to tell me to get up or eat or breathe or... <laughs> it's like, oh, ma'am. Girl. Um, she, gets, uh, she gets to the... Uh, barricade. I almost said bacteria. Uh, she sure, gets to the barricade it. around the inner keep and is thinking about how they'll get through when she trips and alerts the guards with the sound. The guards were warned enough that they are basically waving their swords at all the empty air, hoping to hit an invisible person. And I think that's fantastic. I love uh, it. She like, kills damn it, they one learned. guard. <laughs> she, because she's quick as shit, she kills one guard and maims another. Uh, but then as she's leaving, she realized that she's also been hit, which she finds annoying more than anything else. Um, she's like, oh my God, they cut me. That's so annoying. Um. Dying such a pain. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Uncle the Duke is like, okay, if you have to do this, does it have to be with a 12 year old boy? And Sandry is like, sadly, yes. <laughs> um, Erdo is like, well, if he has a lick of sense, he'll say no. However, chapter 12, Posco is super excited at the prospect of using his dance magic to catch rats. <laughs> the only thing his family really values, ACAB, um, having this cause focuses Posco. So his training goes better than ever because, you know, you give an ADHD person a goal and they will fucking see it through. Um, it, yeah. It's something that means something to them, at least. Yeah. I'm um, interested in this so I can actually focus on it. Yeah. Uh, Sandra tells Yasmin what they need and reminds her how precise Pasco's moves need to be. If he even brushes the unmagic net, it would overtake him. Sandra silently frets, but Yasmin assures her that not only is she a wonderful dance instructor, because <laughs> obviously, um, but Pasco is a naturally talented student. Uh, this gives Sandra some confidence. She examines the net, courtesy of Grandmother Netmender, and is taught the knots she will need to learn to make it herself. She does not let Grandmother Net Netmender does not let her go until she has perfected the four knots she's going to need. Like, she's like, nope, nope, do it right. <laughs> I don't know why, but I imagine, like, just a, a little Filipino grandmother being oh. like, no, 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 do it again. <laughs> I don't know why, but I imagined her as uh, Mulan's grandmother. Okay, I can see that, too. That was um, just in my brain. <laughs> uh... There we go. She also speaks with Ulrina and Behazen, who promise they will have the unmagic distilled and ready to use ASAP. Wolfric's funeral happens quickly after his death. It is a touching ceremony where his accomplishments are exalted and, er, extolled, I said, but exalted is what I want to say. Uh, and it is made clear how respected and beloved he was. As his pyre is lit, Sandry promises him that she will make this right. Sandry finishes putting down Mark so Pasco can practice being precise when she, when she receives a package from Lark. In it is the large drop spindle she will use to t make the unmagic cord for net. For the net. <sniffs> that night, the Duke and a small army accompany Sandry to the ridge w between Winding Circle and the Mire. You guys remember the Mire? That's where the sickness broke out. Um, here, she has to purify herself with a wash before she can handle the unmagic. The wash is full of plants all grown and gathered by Briar and Rosethorn before they left, so she quickly feels more calm. She feels her siblings around her, her uncle waiting for her, and Lark nearby to protect everyone if something goes wrong. She knows she can do this. Uh, the process is grueling, and as... The process is grueling as the unmagic tries to sap Sandry's very will to live from her. It kind of contextualizes some of the thoughts from Alzina's POV because they're, they both have bout, bouts of apathy, and Alzina even notes she doesn't feel love for her husband anymore. Um, like, it's very casual, too. It's just like, oh, yeah, like, the love I once felt for Nurhar. Yeah. She also then later says she doesn't care for a husband that giggles. 
<sighs> God. Um, Sandry, the stubborn girl she is, does not give in and uses her magic to to power her through she even hears briar in her head goading her into not giving up after hours which of work, that i yeah. took that as being literal because he's it the only one well closer close mm-hmm. enough to she she says at the beginning that he's the only one really close enough to i i honestly with her. want to i, I she don't she said remember, daja but I, and I, briar because tris is going down to south uh to south africa yeah but it's actually uh, all it's it's like greece but all the way yeah. down south. Like it's a real bad place, but we'll get to it. Um it is weird. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she feels she actually hears him in her head. That's what that's yeah. what it's like, what, Duchess, you gonna give up? It's it's so good. Um It is. It's really cute. After hours of work, standing on her feet, her joints swelling and hurting, she runs out of unmagic. Mood. The qu- <laughs> the cord is done. Now, on to the net. Her work isn't done yet. Alzina and Nurhar are both depressed now. Also, the mage got a hold of the drugs and was useless for three days before they realized. Alzina takes the salt from the mage and is like, hey, what if we try it? So they both take the drug and are now up and about and ready to be existing. Do you know? It's that... So basically... This poor boy Methane. has has um, clinical depression and he's self medicating. Yeah, yeah, literally. I mean, this it, poor it's... dude. <laughs> um. So they then decide to go try the roof and strap the mage to their back to scope it out. Uh, they're like, okay, maybe, maybe now that we have the energy to do something, let's get something done in this time we yeah, have the yeah, energy yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fucking, duh, don't get me started. Um, they are tweaked out of their goddamn minds. They are, they are. Um, so they're going to go scope it out from the roof, as I said. <laughs> Sandra emerges from the tent, completely exhausted. She sleeps in the cart all the way back to Dersh and Rokat's house. Um, Dersh and Rokat is, I did not explain until... I realized just now that I said his name, but he has volunteered to be bait um, because they said that it's much easier to get people to come to a place with the magic if they already have a reason to go there. Just having the idea out of the blue is going to make them suspicious. So they have to cause, um, cause, you know, give them something. Um, but he's going to go to his house, and that's where they're setting up the net and the whole trap situation. So that's why he has a name. Um, she wakes up and Lark hands her food. I love how Tammy always talks about what they eat. It's a really nice detail. And they tell Pasco that once he's done with his dance, he should go home. He protests it, but they tell him that it's already decided, which is totally what works for 12-year-old boys. Absolutely. <sighs> At 2 p.m., the play starts. Dershon Rokat makes a scene about leaving the Citadel and leaves with his guards. Sandri sets up her net and gets Pasco ready to do his part. Skyfire, we know him. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to explain him because she doesn't. Um, gives Pasco a pouch of dragon salt to leave in the net at the end. And he's like, oh, this is illegal. Do you know that you get killed for this? Just selling it is just having it. <laughs> It's like, okay, (laughs) calm down, cop kid. Um, And they're like, yes, honey, we know. Uh, Pasco does his dance beautifully and leaves the pouch in the middle. They then tell him to go home. Uh, The Dihiners are scouting in the Citadel when Dershan Rokat makes his big scene. Pasco's spell does its thing and both the Dinahars and the mage all feel the pull to go after him, feeling very strongly that it is the right thing to do. (laughs) On his way out... Pasco does an incredibly 12-year-old boy thing. He decides he will stay and watch. (laughs) He remembers a move from an allurement dance Yasmin showed him, and he figures that if he does the opposite of the movement, he can become invisible. And it works. Um, (laughs) The only one who almost sees through it is Lark. Um, But he has to, like, do the move again to, like, intensify it, and she kind of walks away. Oh, this boy. Um... So I'm going to tell this in a much more linear way than than Tammy did. So uh, just prepare. Uh, so chapter 14, Sandry is lying in wait when the Dihiners appear. 
Literally, Alzina orders the mage to remove the unmagic and Sandra can finally see who she's been up against. In this, she finally realizes how young the mage is, around Posca's age, with no legs and a drug problem. Real nice dinners. Uh, Alzina calls out for the pe people hiding to show themselves. She knows that they're, they're there because she caught Posco eating cake because this ADHD babby. Um, Sandra shows herself. <laughs> she's like, oh, Posco. <laughs> Uh, Sandra shows herself, but her net, sucking in unmagic, keeps Alzina and Nurhar glued in place. Uh, since she can't show her concern for Pasco, as that would give the culprits more power, she asks the young mage if the Dehenner's cut off his legs. He tells her that pirates did it, and Alzina and Nurhar are his friends because they sometimes give him the salt. And Alzina begins cutting Pasco and says she will let him go if Sandry lets them go. Uh, Sandry ever precise and purposeful, plays like she is going to do so while she thinks about how to get Pasco out of there. Suddenly she remembers the thread of his uh, of his magic. I almost said unmagic because I keep saying unmagic. Suddenly she remembers the thread of his magic, which she uh, which allows her to find him. That's that's but, how she tracks him earlier yeah. in the book. Um, yeah, because yeah. his as he was leaving the fishing village the first time, she was like, mm, he's not going to come back. So yeah, she that, that, kid, a that kid's a little, a little uh, twitchy. I'm going to... Uh, just, just, just put a little tracker on him. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, she unleashes the net, so the unmagic calls the unmagic and the people, and begins to unravel them. It's deeply upsetting. In the same moment, she pulls as hard as she can on Pasco's thread, hurling him across the room, but saving him. The unmagic swallows the young mage with ease, and he, like, just gives into it, um, but pulls the two adults apart as the unmagic has seeped into their veins. Coldly, she locks eyes with Alzina and sees as the woman realizes what is happening. Nurhar begs for her help, but Sandri only shakes her head. The two assassins explode as the unmagic slices through their flesh. I kind of imagine it, like... Uh, m pressing meat through a grate. Like, okay, like, I was just, it just full metal alchemist again for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I see that, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's the end of that chapter. Oh, it, yeah. It's surprisingly it's, short. Yes, and it's, but it's it's con concise, concise. Very concise. Like, <laughs> honestly, Sandry is, is moving and thinking as she's doing it. She's acting like, oh, I'm so scared. <laughs> Which, she is a little nervous. She doesn't have to really feign that much, but she's Putting it on, you know, putting it on so that they she's think putting she's on her damsel in distress mask. That they don't know who on. she is. They don't they know don't. she's a great mage. They're like, "Who's this bitch? You're a child. <laughs> who let this child in here? <laughs> <laughs> Why are children tracking us down? What is happening? <laughs> You're using a child on your back." <laughs> okay. Um. So epilogue. Uh, Granther Edouard disapproves of Pasco moving in with the dancers, but him moving into Yasmin's school is the next step in his education, so he lets him do it. D it's it's a cute scene, honestly. Well, I was like, Mom, I... I'm not actually, I'm just go moving across town. Well, I don't approve, but, you know, you need to get an education, so fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Granther Edouard, again, only good cop. <laughs> Sandry goes to Discipline to see Lark, and she meets the new novice uh, that Lark talked to her about that it was not important enough to explain earlier. Um, but she meets the new novice, uh, Comas? I, I, I figured Comas, because I figured oh, kind of like Tomas. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. My brain was just um, pronouncing Comas. it Thomas. Thomas. Oh. So Comas. That, that works, too. But uh, Kamas, who runs away after seeing her because he is cripplingly shy. <laughs> uh, after a few weeks of not like moping exactly, but she has a depressive episode. Yeah. She has a depressive episode um, and she is finally brought back to being in the present by getting a bunch of letters from Sandry. Not oh, Sandry. She's Sandry. She's Sandry. <laughs> I was going to say Sandry Lark. Sandry sent Frostbury. you a letter. <laughs> Sandry Larkin Frostpine. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> From Tris, Daja, and Briar. <laughs> Woof. Oh my god. Um, uh. <laughs> um, and they're sending her all these letters being like, why haven't you written? She's like, because I did a murder. Um, and she, <laughs> I mean, that's, she, she says to Lark, I have blood on my hands. I don't know how to live with this. And Lark is like, well, the fact that that's how you feel about it is good. Yeah. 
Like, means, that's, you know, wanton murder isn't on the cards for you. Yeah. So, you know. So, which is great. So, <laughs> she visits Lark to discuss her future, and they decide that she should move to the Citadel for good. Lark says that she has outgrown discipline. Uh, she, she says it's as if you are taking off your gowns and donning your six-year-old dresses again. <laughs> um, why do I know so many of these lines by heart in this book? Because Lark and Sandry are, because you'll notice it's largely the, like, Lark and Sandry moments. Yes. Yes. They're Those so are just, easy. yeah. They're beautiful and, like, just sweet and, like, some of the most parental moments. They are. Healthy parent. She has healthy parents. Her mommy yeah. and Uncle the Duke. Uncle the Duke, who just, you know, loves Duke her uncle. pieces. <laughs> it's like, this girl can do anything she says her mind to. Mice. Yeah. He's like Uncle Phil. Yeah. A great, a great uncle who dotes yeah. on great nieces, you know? Yeah. Um, Doesn't everybody have that? Yeah. <laughs> and they all worked for Microsoft, right? Right? <laughs> Just a little bit of lore for you guys. Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, Lark says that she's outgrown discipline, and Sandry reluctantly agrees. She says that uh, Kumas can have her old room, since she thinks that being near Lark's workshop will do him good. Hmm. Sandry, on her way up to tell Kumas that he can have her room, uh, Sandry realizes that there are other young mages out there who haven't been discovered. She decides to write to her siblings to tell them to keep an eye out. They were lucky, so she believes it's their turn to spread that luck to others. So Sandry is like, wow, better let them know to keep an eye out. But um bum I wonder if this is going to be some kind of theme through the books. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know what? It's got a thesis. That's the thesis statement. It do. It, it do. It do have that. And you know what? Actually, that's a really good way to put it, because then I would say that Dodge's book and Briar's book, so Cold Fire and Street Magic, are like the main body of this essay of a book series. And then yeah. you get the conclusion with Triss. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah Absolutely. It, honestly. And, and especially with it going into um, Briar's book first, because oh, yeah. of what he deals with and who he finds and how they deal with that. God, it's so, so hard so to talk excited. about it. Like, with I'm such so sh- fucking oh, excited. Oh my god, this is, uh, honestly that book has some of my favorite world building in this entire yes! Uh, series. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I love it. Oh, it's so fucking cool. Mm. Um, but yes, so that's the book. Um, we, I, I think as as we continued reading, we got more excited about it. I, it's that's the whole thing. Okay, so it is a really, uh, it is a good story. Yeah. It, 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 but what it suffers from is um, not explaining itself. Yeah. Um, so, like, they, she doesn't hide things from us, like the names of the people or, 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 like, what they're doing. But she doesn't explain who these people are and why we're suddenly reading them. I honestly, one of the first bits when, um, I think, like, I, I read the first parts and then took up a little break. And then I went back and I started with Alzina. And I was like who the fuck is Alzina? And I was like, did I miss something? And I had to go back and reread. I was like, oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. And honestly, even then, I kept going, having to go back because I could not remember. Um, but I think that that's part of what the book suffers from a little bit is she was trying a new thing where she was just like, okay, let me just throw these little vignettes of the criminals because, you know, honestly, she does write a lot of this uh, second series like crime shows. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I don't hate. It's just, like... Different. Abrupt, and it's, it's a little harder to read than it is to, like, watch on a television. Like, yeah. it's definitely got some CSI feels. Yeah, at least that one did. Yes. Yeah, um, that, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, because I... Yeah. And I think the only one that doesn't feel like that to me is Street Magic, which is next. Um, yeah. I think the other three do have that feel of, like, crime shows, but oh, street magic is just... That's because street magic is a little bigger than just crime. Street magic is amazing. I am so it fucking is. excited. There's so much in this one. Ugh. Okay. Um, what were, like, our favorite parts? Um, honestly, the relatable Sandry bits. Uh, yeah. Like, I... I, I, I get her so much. Like, okay, we talk about, like, 
basically there's a lot of of young Ariana in Sandry. Yeah. Like I I could be absolutely sweet and I was a, over polite to the point where I wouldn't um, go to the bathroom or eat or ask for water um, when I went to people's houses and and then there would just be moments of, of an outburst and I would just like let everything go and everybody be like Jesus Christ who are you um, yeah. so I feel that I feel that very much <laughs> yeah Definitely. but they happened I think more, a little more frequently because I was like all over the place yeah that unmedicated adhd i don't know you know which brings me back to the the discussion i was gonna have have there no (laughs) okay so in my opinion briar definitely adhd oh absolutely tris definitely autism Mm -hmm. sandry what do you think um i feel like she's honestly uh more anxiety it, which comes out as, a, as as some ADHD tendencies but it is OCD largely. Mm, that's yes. why that's why she works so well with um stitches and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Oh my god, totally. Cuz stitching is the ultimate mm-hmm. like yeah, <laughs> compulsion. It really, really is. <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, if I, you know, if I'm having all of these worries about uncle's health, then I can just do this ritual to make that not an issue. Right? And then my worry is, is assuaged. Like, that's literally yeah. what it is. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, Daja? Daja's definitely autism as well. Yeah, that's um, what I was thinking. She's, she's... She has her... Spe- it's very much a special interest. Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. More than any of the others. Like, yeah. this is her... Her special yeah. interest. And it's, it's like when... Um, when Sandry is like, oh, I can tell Dodge is thinking about uh, metal work because look at that look in her eyes because that's that's the thing that lights her up. She's just like, yeah, fuck yeah, I love this. It's true. And then that's why it's so in her book, she deals with the ADHD twins and she's like, I don't get this. I, I don't like this. Everybody needs to calm down. I'm tired of being <laughs> the adult in the room. <laughs> It's like, honey, you've been the adult in the room since you were 11. I'm so sorry. You were the adult of your four siblings, even though they're all older than you. (laughs) It's true. Mood. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, just all of Ariana's friends were complete. Dingbats? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Chuffle brains. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies, don't say chuffle chuffle brains. That's street. This lady does. That's cute. Um, no, that was Bleeder that she said that he said that about. Yeah, Bleeder. Shuffle brains is what makes her laugh. My brother says that. <laughs> it's cute. Uh, oh. My original game for the end of this episode was going to be Smash or Pass, because I think that we should do this for a couple uh, a couple things per book, okay. because I think that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Duke, Uncle the Duke, Smash or Pass? You know, probably Smash. Mm. Yeah, he seems like he, he, he's got that, he's got that energy. Hmm. I'm going to pass. That's that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wolfric, smash or pass? I'm going to say pass. <laughs> I'm going to say pass. But I love him. Um, <laughs> Alzina, smash or pass? You know, after we get the description of how she looks, smash. Smash. Fucking go for it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like when Sandry finally mm-hmm. sees her is the first time that, in, in the last fucking chapter she, she's like oh she's got these girthy hips and she's just like, like yeah. oh oh my <laughs> well goodness gracious <laughs> um then my next question was um Yasmin smash or oh. pass yeah yeah I, I'll probably smash smash she's yeah. yeah she seems very high maintenance but you know what I do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> She's very high maintenance, but like worth it. Yeah. Um, and then my last and she at one. least tells you how she needs to be taken care it's of. It's true, she does. <laughs> She's very bossy about it, but not yeah. like in a dom way. Just like in a no. these are my requirements kind of way. <laughs> um, yes. and then I was what was the last one I was going to say? Oh, Oama and Quabin, smash or pass. I'd say smash them both. Probably. Honestly, I, I, I just, I, I love them so much. I, I don't even know what they're really like. I'm just like, oh, these babies. Yeah, they're great. I babysit them. 
Okay. So yeah. that's so it's a pass. So that's a pass. That's a definite pass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh so that's uh that's magic steps. And what are we gonna read next month? That will actually be next month because yes. I am now unemployed, so I have no excuse. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I, I get to be working from home this next week. I'm so excited. Yeah. Because um, all I got to do is data entry. Um, nice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so next month, we're going to read the second Briar book, which is titled Street Magic. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> That's such a funny one. <laughs> it's, it's called st- Street Magic. <laughs> like, I've never heard this before. Is that, am I saying it right? Honestly, like, because magic steps weirds me because I, for whatever reason, think it should be step magic. And so it's like, is it magic streets? I like how the first two, she was like, oh, I'm going to put magic in the title. And then she got to Dodger's book and she was like, no, that's no. stupid. Cold fire. Oh, I got chills, man. Uh, but yes, I'm very excited for street magic. Yeah. It is so fantastic. And I'm... We get some it, good, like, uh, Rose Thorn lore. We get some great new characters. We, uh, oh, I yeah, love Rose Thorn so much yes. in that book because there's, like, that breakdown. Anyway. Oh, it's so good. Oh, my God. Y'all. And the cats. It's just, oh, God. I, I'm just going to keep talking <laughs> about it. Okay. So, that is, that is the episode. We love you guys. Um, I'm I'm Risa. I'm Ariana. I'm, we're and just gonna say, "Okay, love you, bye bye." Okay, love you, bye bye. Keep on reading. <laughs>once again, my brain. Every single time I read the word epilogue, a little epilogue to this tale of sadness, says <laughs> dragged down the street by his royal dadness. Rounded a corner, then came to a shop, threw me inside. Jake's barber shop. I said, please, sir, just a little off the top. Dude, shade me bare. Gave me a lollipop. Now, on my head, there's nothing but stubble. Man, I hate being in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> yeah, that. That. Every, every fucking time. <laughs>